Okay, great. Uh, my name is Luca Jakobowicz, and I am extremely honored to be here. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about reactive programming in the browser with uh, Scala.js and PureScript. So, let's begin. Um, first, the agenda. Um, I'm going to start with a small intro into Scala.js and PureScript. We're going to be comparing um, the benefits and uh, the trade-offs of choosing each language. And then um, we're going to get right into the meat. And afterwards, I want you to be able to answer the question, what exactly is reactive programming? And I'd also like you to be able to answer, why would anyone use reactive programming? And at the end, um, I'd like to show you like a, a small app built using these techniques in a live coding session. OK, so without further ado, um, first things first, Scala.js. Um, Scala.js first appeared in 2013. Um, it, it's being developed at EPFL. Um, and it's a very simple Scala to JavaScript compiler. That means it just takes Scala source code and compiles it to JavaScript. Um, what it does not do is take uh, .class files, so JVM bytecode uh, does not work. Um, it can compile almost all Scala code without any changes to existing code. Uh, there are a few exceptions, namely um, multi-thread code can't work in JavaScript because JavaScript is inherently single-threaded. Um, other things that do not work are reflection because it would cost uh, a huge runtime overhead. Um, which the implementers didn't want to uh, incur. Um, yeah, and then we have PureScript, which also incidentally uh, appeared in 2013. Um, it is very, very strongly inspired by Haskell, and as such, it is also uh, purely functional, like Haskell, um, which means there are no side effects in PureScript code. Effects are first class values. And um, some people like to say PureScript is like, a mix between Haskell and JavaScript, but I think it's more like 90% Haskell and about 10% JavaScript. Um, and those 10% mainly come in because PureScript was built uh, explicitly for the, for the JavaScript ecosystem and the JavaScript environment. And what this means, um, in essence, is that, for example, JavaScript, uh, PureScript arrays and PureScript records, which are kind of like case classes, um, uh, they correspond exactly to JavaScript objects and JavaScript arrays. So what this means is that PureScript can uh, compile very, very um, almost natively to JavaScript without any runtime overhead. And without further ado, let's look at some of the similarities between Scala.js and PureScript. Um, and the first thing I picked out was function composition. And um, you can see here on the left-hand side, we have a list of one, two, three, and we map over it uh, using an anonymous function, a lambda, uh, where we map over it and say we want to add one to each, and then we want to filter all of those that are not over or that are not larger than three. And if we look at the Scala and PureScript code side by side, you can see it's very similar. This is in, fa in part because Scala, you can choose um, to use dot notation, so you can say list dot map, or you can just uh, choose to choose to uh, not use the dot and just forgo it. Um, in PureScript, we have this hashtag, which is basically a function that takes another function and um, uh, basically um, it it is uh, an infix operator which uses the um, like for example here, the one, two, three is actually the last param parameter of the map uh, function. So map is usually map usually um, has first the function and then the actual array or the actual functor, um, and this allows us to uh, to write it like uh, in the SVO subject verb ob object style that we're used to from uh, or most of us are used to from object oriented or similar style of code. And then we have anonymous functions uh, bound to variables or bound to values. Um, in the last three left, we can see here val plus three. And then we actually ex explicitly need a type annotation that says this, um, this 
this function is of type int to int, so it takes an int and outputs an int, whereas in pure script, this can be inferred. And then we have uh, function composition by usage of the three uh, greater than signs in both languages. Um, this is actually in Scala, this is uh, cats syntax. Uh, you can also do this without cats using and then or uh, compose. And um, what this does is it just, uh, it's a function that when applied will, um, will add three and then multiply by four. So we can see here that already Scala and TrueScript um, in a functional sense, they are very similar. Um, and then we also have some features that are usually considered part of functional programming, and those are ADTs and pattern matching. Um, ADTs are algebraic, algebraic data types, and um, what we can see here is just a simple definition of a sum type, meaning that it's either one or the other. So um, in the pure script example here, we have data maybe A, and it's either just an A or it's nada, which is nothing. Um, I chose nada here as a name because in Scala, nothing already is uh, a type, so we can't use nothing. Um, and you can see here in Scala, this requires a lot more boilerplate, and um, these sometimes are, for a lot of people, they're very essential. So um, having this done in a more concise way is actually a very big benefit for pure script. But um, in Scala, in the new Dottie version, um, that's probably going to be Scala 3.0, uh, we're also going to be have a very, very concise syntax for defining these sum types. And then um, pattern matching, as you can see, is also very similar. We just check if our x, which is of type maybe, uh, is either just something or nothing, nada. Okay. So um, let's look at an, the next picture. And that is monadic comprehensions. Um, this is uh, a core feature to uh, strongly typed functional programming languages, but it's actually a uh, feature not, not very many uh, programming languages have. Apart from PureScript, Scala, and all um, Haskell, Idris, um, I think very, very few out of this Haskell family actually have this. So Scala, I think, is more the outlier. But uh, what this allows us to do is, this is basically just syntax sugar for uh, flat map in Scala and bind in PureScript or Haskell. Um, and what this code does is it, uh, takes the, it computes the Pythagorean uh, triplets for the numbers 1 to 20. Um, yeah, and here you can see it also looks very, very similar. similar. Um, yeah. And then we also have the notion of higher kind of types in both languages. Uh, higher kind of types are also a very rare feature in programming language, but it's, they, they can be very, very useful. And what higher kind of types uh, means, in essence, that we can abstract over type constructors. Here, our type F, uh, that we can see here, um, isn't actually a type. It's a type constructor, meaning it's a function that takes a type and returns another type. So F isn't actually a type, but f of int would be a type, or f of string. And uh, the same goes for pure script. And a functor is basically anything we can map over. So this, um, in, in the left, we can define a trait functor for any uh, type constructor, and in the right, we define what we call a type class in pure script. Um, not going to go further into this. So now let's look at some of the differences. Um, at first, we, in Scala, we have inheritance, which means subtype uh, polymorphism. And that can actually be, um, when working with JS APIs, it can make it easier because a lot of JavaScript APIs are inherently based on inheritance. And modeling these in pure script can be, well, it can be kind of tedious. Usually, you could define some sort of DSL, but it takes a lot more steps to uh, get the same code working. In pure script. Um, on the other hand, you have pure script, which guarantees referential transparency through its uh, purely functional type system, which is really cool. Um, in Scala, for example, you can partially apply um, a function by any parameter. Um, um, and contrast that with pure script, where all functions are queried by default, meaning that um, pure script doesn't actually have partial application because 
uh, all functions are already of arity one. But what this means is that if you have like a function uh, that takes three or four par parameters, um, or the equivalent in pure script where you have a function that returns a function that, and then returns a function, returns a function, um, is that we can, for example, partially apply the first, param uh, the first param parameter. In pure script and Haskell, you always um, usually only, um, well, partially apply in that sense the last parameter. Um, so it's a trade off in that sense. Um, in Scala, we have, in Scala.js specifically, we have the problem or the trade-off that we need a runtime environment because Scala already is uh, a language in itself. So putting that to support JavaScript, we need to put support all of the Scala semantics, the semantics that are already predefined. And to do that, we incur a sort of runtime uh, cost, like I said before. Um, contrast that to PureScript, where I already said it has JavaScript semantics, which means um, there is no runtime overhead at all. PureScript functions just, um, they are just JavaScript functions. And in Scala, uh, a function is not actually a JavaScript function. It's an object and a class. So um, there's some very subtle differences that need to be uh, considered. Another cool thing PureScript does is that um, the F type, which is like Haskell's IO, or um, similar types can actually optimize out calls to bind. So if you have a large um, structure of monadic, uh, monadic sequencing, um, at some, in some cases it can be completely optimized away. Um, and also the ST monad, which is um, a monad that can, that can uh, use a mutable state, um, can actually compile to JavaScript variables. So um, instead of mutating uh, mutating some some um, some actual variable like like you would do in, in Scala, where you can actually have access to bars, you would use an ST monad in PureScript, and it would, would compile to a JavaScript variable, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, and then in Scala, you have implicits with Martin, uh, what where Martin talked about it a lot uh, this morning, so I'm not going to go further into that. And then you have string interpolation, which um, probably a lot of you know, but it's basically uh, an easier way to do string uh, concatenation. And it also supports dynamic typing, which can be, well, it can be good or bad. Um, basically, if you want to work with JavaScript APIs, you can either choose to provide strong types for the API, for the JavaScript, underlying JavaScript API, or you can choose to just use dynamic typing. Um, I would always go for the, uh, for the strong types, but if you're so inclined, you can also use dynamic typing. So it's, you have some sort of flexibility there. Um, on the other end, PureScript, I've already talked about this, but PureScript has Hindley Miller type inference. And that can be really cool because um, in Scala, sometimes you end up with a lot of type annotations. And in PureScript, you can write your whole program completely without type annotation because the type, uh, type inference system is really, really powerful. I think there are some edge cases where you need to, but you probably won't run into those. Um, another cool thing is nested record updates. And those are like basically you have a very, very deep immutable structure, like an immutable tree of sorts, and you want to update some kind of leaf. Um, in Scala and other programming languages, this can be very difficult. Basically, you have to copy the, uh, the most upper uh, object or record and then copy all of the other um, as you go deeper. And then in the end, you only change the leaf. Uh, PureScript allows a syntax that, that does this very, very easily without, actually, uh, without much boilerplate. So it's really nice. And PureScript also has rogue polymorphism, which is used, to, uh, which is used for ex ex uh, extensible effects and extensible uh, records. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go much further into that. So the big question is, how do we develop user interfaces with pure functional programming? Right? This, is, um, this is a very difficult question, because user interfaces are usually riddled with side effects. Every click usually incurs a state change. Um, 
sometimes we want to do some sort of network stuff. And we can see that uh, uh, user interfaces are just riddled with side effects, or what we usually have as side effects. So uh, one of the answers to this is definitely not the only one, but is reactive programming. Um, and I want you to think of reactive programming as very simply just programming with asynchronous data streams. Um, and if you think about a data stream, I don't know, who, who here has used some form of data streams, stream APIs? OK, so that's a lot of you. So if you think about a stream um, in the sense that maybe someone uses his mouse, and that's actually a stream of values. Like, for example, it will emit every five milliseconds the x and y position of your mouse. Or if you have your keyboard as a stream, it will emit all the things you emitted um, as values over time. And uh, a representation to make this more, to visualize this, is something that we call a marble diagram. And you can think of this uh, like the x-axis here is um, like the time. So this might be like, I don't know, 6 o'clock. And this is like 6 o'clock and 2 seconds. I don't know how long it takes to type hello. Um, yeah, and so this, uh, these are basically values over time. And this isn't inherently useful by itself, but we can leverage some of these properties. And the first one is that uh, streams usually are functors. That means we can map over them. And then we get something like this, which means that um, we get a whole new stream that will just emit all the items we emitted before, but with this function applied. In this sense, it's uh, too lower cased. So we get another stream, which also emits hello, but this time it will emit it um, in the lower case. And what streams also are, are applicatives, which means you can combine many streams, right? And that's, that's really, really helpful. So if you think about it, you can, you can create a whole program just by getting the inputs as streams like, right, like so your mouse position and your keyboard inputs, and then combine them, map them, and then to create some sort of visual at the end, which is your program. Um, but actually, there's one thing missing there, and that is how do we manage state between, between two emissions here, right? So how do we know at this point what came before it? And that's where the scan function comes in. Does anyone know the scan function from the Scala standard library? No, OK. Uh, it's also sometimes called fold p. But I think it uh, can demonstrate it very well by looking at this chart. Um, and basically, what scan is, it's very similar to a fold. But a fold works on um, data structures that are, uh, that are f finite, mostly. right? So if you want to fold over a list, you can do that easily. But streams aren't necessarily finite. They can be infinite. They can, for example, mouse positions. They don't stop at any point, right? We don't. We we want those. We want to get those continually and work with those. Um, and what this does is basically it uses some sign of combined function, like with a fold and an identity, which here would be the empty string. Um, and then we get intermediate values. So every time, uh, every time a new emission comes from the uh, old stream. We apply this function to the values that came before it. So we get here the pluses here as string concatenation. Uh, sadly, Scala uses plus as string concatenation. Um, but yeah, what we can see here is we are able to hold state of our um, of our events using the scan function. And this is re really at the heart of reactive programming um, for UIs because having a uh, cumulative state is one of the most important things. OK, so far, so good. So you can probably all envision like some kind of idea how you could uh, make this, turn this into programs. But it sounds kind of academic, right? So how is, this, how is that useful? And for once, um, because streams are values over time, it also allows us to use time-based operations. Um, and what this means is, for example, the debounce time operator. Uh, what this does is it takes, um, every time it emits, it awaits the time you give it here in milliseconds and looks, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if there's any interruptions, 
it will reset this timer. So what we can see here is A uh, emits, and then we start basically under the hood, we start a timer that goes 20 milliseconds. And if, if there's no other emission by then, we emit the value in the resulting stream. And then we have here a B, and then we wait, and then we see, oh, okay, C comes along. And then we get another 20 milliseconds, and then it emits. Um, and then with D, it's the same. And what's really cool about this is if you think about, for example, um, a, search, a search functionality where you want to send uh, HTTP requests whenever someone inputs something into a search field. Well, for the one you want this to be uh, to the happen as he types, right? We don't want to actually press some sort of button, but we don't also don't want to do this after every single keystroke. And if you think about this, this can be leveraged extremely easy for um, for this kind of thing, right? So it will only if if we have two uh, keystrokes very very nearby, we'll only use the latest. And that's, that's really, really cool. Just if you imagine doing this in the imperative way or with functional functions and effects, um, restarting a timer and then resetting that um, and looking for interruptions in between. Like if you were to do this manually, it would involve a lot of moving parts and get complex very easily. In, in reactive programming with reactive streams, this is just one line and then you got it. Um, and another cool, really cool thing is, uh, is buffer time. Um, there's lots more. I'm just going to show you these two, but there's lots more. And buffer time uh, basically just buffers some sort of values over a specific time. So if we buffer time over 100 milliseconds, it, after a single emission, we'll wait 100 milliseconds and then add all of these extra emissions into a buffer. And this can be really useful if we think about having a stream of all uh, some kind of different actions that a user might want to do. Um, so maybe we have this user and he clicks a lot of things. And then um, instead of sending uh, uh, an HTTP request for each thing, we can then um, accumulate these values that we, that we buffered up. And then uh, we can send only one HTTP request, for example. Uh, so we can use this to optimize um, the pipeline in that sense. OK, so uh, let's check out some code. And I'm going to be starting with PureScript. Um, well, let's just delete everything. Um, and first, I'm just going to use a synchronous observable. And we're going to use the create function that comes from um, Rx, which maybe some of you are. Uh, Rx, uh, this is just a basic wrapper for PureScript over RxJS. And the create function takes an observer, uh, takes a function from an observer to some effect. And an observer is just a data structure that has a, a next function, a next function that, um, that basically tells us what to mix a bit next, an error function and a completed function. So it just tells the observable that, um, that will be created what, what needs to be done. So if we create just a very simple uh, synchronous observable, we can do something like this. One, third, next, two. And um, what we're doing right here is we're invoking uh, uh, an effect with do notation. Um, which will basically this just sequence, the, sequence these. And um, now if we want to run this, we actually need to subscribe to this observable. And we're just going to subscribe to the next events. Um, and we're going to subscribe by using the log show function, which uh, just logs the things we input to the console. Um, and then. We're just going to use, uh, we're going to give the sync observable. And actually, because now we have um, an effect of an effect, because subscribe uh, is an effect and create is also an effect. So both of these are uh, side effectful. If, so we actually have to wrap them in an effect, an F, which is an IO. Um, we actually have to join these. So join is like flatten. Um, so yeah, and now. If, if we were to run, run this, uh, let's see, pop run, 
hope it compiles. Yeah, and then we see we get one, two, three. So this is kind of cool, but it's also fairly unexciting. So let's try to do something asynchronous instead. And what we'll do here is um, we want to emit an event every time um, every time someone clicks on the on the DOM body. So we're just going to use this function add body click listener, and you can see here it takes an effect and it's um, then registers this effect to execute every time we press on the body of the DOM. And what we're going to do is right here, we're just going to say uh, every time we do this, we want the observer to emit one. I need to put this in parentheses. And now what we see here, oh yeah, now this should work. Let's actually um, browserify it to, to JavaScript. And now we can look at this. And we can see here it will continuously emit one. It's still kind of uninteresting. But for example, if we wanted something like um, a transformed observable, we could use our async observable and use it to, uh, to accumulate state, right? For example, we could map each to, I don't know, plus or actually just times 10. And then we could also do something like scan uh, where we just um, where we just add them all up. And then if we do this instead and browser freight, we should get something like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So we are holding some, some kind of state in this app. Um, it's very basic, but if you use this a lot, um, it will actually, you can emerge, you can actually, uh, there, there will emerge some kind of patterns to, um, to handle state effectively. Um, one last thing I wanted to show you is right now, we didn't use any types, but uh, this actually has the type F. I'm not sure if you can see it, probably not. I'm just gonna add it. It's an for all E. It's an F of uh, DOM because it accesses the DOM and it also access, accesses <laughs> the console. We use, we use these two effects. And it also um, returns a subscription, right? Because subscri the subscribe next function returns a subscription. And what this means is that um, when we have an observable and subscribe to it, we usually get a subscription. And um, usually we have to unsubscribe to this. So. Uh, all of these resources that get created, for example, add, add, adding a click listener, um, in order for them to be set free, we also have to tell the subscription that um, it's, it's done, right? So this is kind of annoying in the case that we're, where we're using it right now because we have no clue what to do with the subscription object and returning it from main will not do anything at all. So um, yeah, we're gonna have to figure out how to do that. So let's go back to our slides. Um, and that's why there is a library called Outwatch we created. Um, and Outwatch uh, has three main design goals, and one of those is subscri subscription handling. Um, and the first is updating DOM efficiently without sacrificing abstraction. And what this means, in essence, is, is if we use all these inputs to, um, to build up a stream of our app state, we then somehow need to visualize it, turn it into uh, the DOM. And um, this can be very, very expensive if we have a lots of actions per second and we always recreate some kind of DOM structure. And that's why there is this function, uh, this technique called virtual DOM, which was basically popularized by React. Um, where, you have, where you build these virtual DOM trees and then um, once, once you, once you uh, want to update the actual DOM, you just compare these two virtual DOM trees and um, then only update the actual uh, differences between the two virtual DOM trees. And this is actually really, really efficient. This is why React as a library is incredibly fast. Um, under the hood, Outwatch uses Snap DOM, which is uh, another virtual library separate from React. And then, um, yes. 
the second thing I want to talk about is handling subscriptions automatically. And this means, in essence, that we don't really need to worry about handling all of these things. All of the, um, all of the resources will get released in time. Um, and this, is, this can be done because we know exactly when, um, when certain nodes get released from the DOM. So we can then remove their click listeners. And um, yes, similar things like this. The third is actually more abstruse. But um, we, I, we, I really wanted to remove or restrict the need for higher order observables. And observables, actually, in this sense, are just streams. Um, I don't think. I actually said that yet, <laughs> but yeah, observables are just streams. And so higher order streams or higher order observables are streams of other streams. And um, it can get like, if you try to build an intuition for this, I, I never managed to build an intuition for this. There are other libraries that work with streams that have these and it can get very, um, very overwhelming very fast. So we wanted to restrict that as much as possible. OK, so now that we went through that, let's take a small look. Um, and this is what a small uh, outwatch uh, component looks like. And on the left, we have um, the Scala version. And we ha see here we have div, which is a small function. And it takes actually var args of other uh, virtual DOM elements. So here we only have ch child elements. But we could also add something like ID is equal to some ID or the class or something like that, um, or any uh, attributes that the DOM actually supports. So um, and here we see an H2, with, um, which just says input here. Um, and then an input field, um, where every input string, every string that, that will be input will be directly logged to the console. Um, and this returns the type vnode. And in contrast, in PureScript, this type is called VDOM instead, which, um, which has some technical reasons I'm not going to go into. But it's also parameterized by an effect world type. So because this component interacts with um, the console, is also parameterized as, as such. So you know if you have some list of components, if you have lots of dis different components and you want to figure out why is something being written to the console, um, then you can just check here and see, OK, this, this component actually accesses the console, uh, which is a pretty cool extra feature. And you can also see here uh, the lack of implicits because H2 um, needs this small text function to turn this into a, into a text node which is, well, like a, uh, a, ver uh, a DOM node, which only has text. And in the Scala version right here, uh, this isn't needed because it has Im an implicit conversion. Yes. And now let's look at some more code um, without watch. Not sure how much time I still have. But what I wanted to do is create a small app using the Elm architecture. Um, and has anyone worked with uh, React Redux before? OK. Yeah, that's a few hands. So uh, the premise is very, very similar. Um, similar to like scan, it takes a combine uh, function. And it will, um, it will then update the state according to this function. So we have some kind of action type. And then we have all of our cases. Uh, all of our cases will be the different action types. So for example, if we want to do a to-do app, we could have um, a case class where we update a text field. So we just use a, a case class. Oh, actually, you probably can't see this, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to toggle presentation mode there. Um, and then we, we're just going to define this real quick. And then we also want to be able to add, um, add a to-do to our list. It's also going to extend action. Um, and then what we need is actually uh, our state type. And we're going to create a case class for this called state. And what's going to be is just our current value of the text field. So text field, 
value, which is going to be a string, and a list of to-do, a list of to-dos, which is, for our purposes, just going to be a list of string. So now we have a state and an action. Now it's time to define our reducer function. And the reducer is just going to take uh, a state, like the old state, and then an action, and it's going to return a new state. Oh, state. And we can do this by just matching, uh, wait, state match. And then we can add here a uh, case update text. with a new text. We can then uh, just copy our old state and set the text field value to the text. Um, and in case of our add to do's, we just, we're just going to um, copy the state as well. And we're going to uh, then update the to do's inside by setting them to state dot to do's and we're going to add the state dot current uh, no, text field value. There we go, text field value. Uh, what's, what? Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, there we go. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then we can create something like a Redux store using these um, primitives. And basically, behind, under the hood, it's just implemented with a basic observable that uses uh, the scan function. It's really not much more. And we can create it by, um, oh yeah, actually, we need an initial state before. So let's just create an initial state value that's just going to be state. Um, I'm going to start with an empty string and an empty list. So. initial state and our reducer function. So this is pretty cool. And now the only thing we basically need to do is define our view. And our viewer is going to take a state and it's going to return a virtual DOM tree, which is a vNode in Scala. And what we're going to do is just a simple div um, where we're going to add an input field where the events, actually let's just add a placeholder real quick. To do, oh, to do, and then we're going to um, all the strings that get inputted. We're going to send them to the store. Actually, we need to, sorry, we need to map these to uh, the update text. So here we go, there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add another button to submit these to dos. Um, it's just going to say. Submit, and whenever we press it, so on click, we want to add a to-do to and send it to our store. And then the last thing we're going to do is uh, create a list. And we're going to use a UL, and inside we're going to bind the children to our state. Um, actually, I can just use state. Um, and we're going to want the to-dos, and we're going to map them, every to-do, to, uh, to a LE, LI, like a, a list item of to-do. And the only thing we have to do is uh, use the, expand them to var args, and this should actually uh, just work. Let's see. I hope it, oh yeah. See what happens here. We didn't compile it yet, or the compiler failed. <laughs> Let's just see what happens. What happened here, okay. So waiting for Swiss changes. I'm not sure what happened. Let's just try again. Okay. So ah, I know what happens. <laughs> okay. See here in the uh, in our main function, we're still just rendering hello world. That that makes sense. So we need to actually uh, view, and we're going to start with our initial state. And now this should work. Let's see. 
didn't compile. I'm not sure. Let's just see. Should compiled. Should have compiled. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, this is just a uh, very simple to do app. So, I don't know, clean up laundry. I can't spell. And nothing happens. So, uh, that's odd. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what, what happened here, but I'm just going to copy over the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, code I wrote before. I'm not sure what the difference here is, but I'm, I think I'm fairly short on time. So, yeah, let's just try this. See, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't really see the difference. Okay, let's see, clean up, yeah, and all the talk. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, a very, very basic intro. I could talk about Outwatch for hours and hours, so if you have any uh, questions, even after this uh, session, you can just come up and talk to me. Um, I'd love to answer all of your questions. I think we're basically out of time for questions. So yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a slide here. Yeah, yeah and, uh, just very shortly, if you want to uh, check out more of this, you can visit outwatch.github.io or follow me on Twitter or follow my blog or something like that. Yeah, OK. You can do a quick one question. OK. No questions. Oh, okay. I mean, everything is clear. <laughs> okay, thank you so much.